Welcome to 10,000 Miles. My guest tonight is Paul Treadwell. Oddly enough, I only met Paul about five weeks ago. We met through a mutual friend, Adam Curry, who happened to be guest two on 10,000 Miles podcast, episode number two. Paul is referred to as the oil baron. It's pretty funny. He's been in the oil and gas business for 37 years. He's had a great career, found a lot of success, a great story. He's just a genuinely great guy. When we met, we hit it off immediately and became fast friends. And I really enjoyed talking to him during this podcast. So let's dive in. Hey folks, thanks for tuning into the show. You can find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, the Podcast Index, and Podcasting 2.0. We'd really appreciate if you download Fountain, find us there, and support us via value for value. We hope you enjoy the show. Happy listening. Paul, welcome to the show tonight. How are you doing? Hey, how are you? It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. Hey, this is an interesting show tonight. You know, most of the guests I've had on, I think the the person I've known the least is somebody I've known for about eight years. Yeah. The person I've known the longest I've known for 35 or 40 years. And one of our mutual friends, Adam Curry, was show number two. I've known Adam for 35 years. So for the audience, <laughs> Paul and I met just over a month ago, which is pretty hilarious, but we got caught up really quick, really quick. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, our mutual friend, Adam, renewed his vows, invited us down, and he had a little reception uh, the, the night before their, their, their you know, renewed vows, and we got introduced, and yeah. uh, we started chatting and hit it off. And then my wife says to you and Ashley, hey, um, I don't know what you're doing, but if you want to come by the house, we got an Airbnb and have a drink tonight. And we were up till two in the morning. That yeah. was a uh, that was a good night. Yeah, and it was full of conversation. It was long. It was so oh, yeah. great. Yeah, we we thoroughly enjoyed. It. Had a great time, and then Tom has a dick. It's two in the morning. Yeah, we He's got like, game time tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was great. So, why don't you start off by telling the audience, you know, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you're doing now. Yeah, uh, Paul Treadwell, um, started, uh, on the wall in the gas industry probably 37 years ago. And, uh, it's college. I was in college for a short period of time <clears throat> and got a position in the oil and gas industry and then just progressed from there. And eventually, um, met my partner, my client partner, uh, in business. Uh, Brian Sheffield, and met him in 2006 uh, while I was working for his dad. I, I was with his dad for about 17 years, uh, Scott Sheffield, you know, Connor Natural Resources. And then um, Brian was fresh out of, I say fresh out of NCU, he was with us when he learned Dallas. He went to uh, Australia, Spain. Uh, selling bonds and security. Really strong every retail exchange for a while. Decided that he wanted to get into the oil and gas business like his dad and grandfather. Uh, his grandfather was Joe Parsley. Predecessor company to Pioneer Natural Resources was Parker and Parsley. That was worked for them in 1992. Why is that? Well, in 2007, he approached me and said, hey, I want to start an oil and gas company. I said, well, it's good. So, so that's a big challenge. And he said, yeah, I would like for you to come join me and help me do it. Nice. And uh, <clears throat> I had a great career going at Pioneer. really didn't see any reason why I needed to leave. But um, why don't I talk about it and kind of what he was forming was an entity that 
he was going to give equity, truly equity, not waterfall equity, to certain employees. And so uh, he said, this is how that works. He said, I'd love to give you a piece of the company. And he said, yeah, we'll grow it into like a $50 million business. And, you know, he did shirt keys and I'll get the majority of it because obviously it's his company. And he sure. Said, he said, uh, I'd like to see if they grow enough where I could get maybe 50 million out of it for myself. And he said, and you see where that goes. I said, you know what? That sounds crazy, but, uh, I like the idea. Let's go do it. He said, really? I said, yeah, let's do it. And so, um, we did grew the company, um, relatively quickly, actually, um, just had a very moment in time of bonds in office and he was a coast of cries, but in our industry, when there's a Democrat in the office, all in gas, energy stocks, and just all gas, uh, the, the business itself in general does pretty good because it, let's say regulatory things in place and it hit us drilling, you didn't have its production. So. For us, price, it it creates a supply problem, which it drives up price, right? And, and that's what any commodity is, a supply and demand. Yeah. So I think you probably remember oil hit 140 plus. Mm-hmm. We timed that just right. Sure do. And then technology came along where you can drill, so drilling vertically, you can drill horizontally. And so that just, and, and to the producing zones, that just made the oil and gas industry even more prolific. Same time, I just arrived. And um, his dad told him, we were repelled so fast. The last two years we were in business, Dick, our, our and this is calculated, and then in our, we were like 275 plus percent CAGR per year the last wow. two years. Wow. Holy cow. Long. Yeah. So the growth is dramatic. That's insane. It, it was insane. It was heavy workload. Um, Paul, just to let the audience know how remarkable that is. I was in an all day meeting on Tuesday and I can't name the name of the company. They were, we were talking about companies and in my industry, if you've got a 20% CAGR demonstrated, you're a unicorn. Yeah. Okay. You're considered a unicorn at 20%. You're considered like an anomaly. That was, a, that was a, you guys are an anomaly, right? Then they were looking yeah, at it. And so 275 it, is off the chain. It was, it was really crazy. I mean, just in terms of what we were doing, but here's the problem. We, we did, um, we did local investors, you know, mm-hmm. Millen and Collier Basin, Millen, Texas area. And then they couldn't keep up with our growth. You know, it was just friends and family and local people. So then you start doing in mezzanine deals, um, and you start doing bank debt. And kind of that kind of growth rate, but obviously you notice none of that can keep up. So we were about 900 million in debt, but the growth and the cash flow associated with that was, was staying with it. The problem is our budget for 2014 was really going to be more than what a bank could get in terms of loans. So I thought I'd give it up every Yeah. Well, Brian's dad had problems to having taken uh, Pioneer Public and just his years as an executive and in, uh, in that public sector, he said, Brian, you don't have any choice. This is what your, your growth rate is. So she is. He said, you don't have any choice but to go public. So that was Christmas of 2012. And I always wanted to go public today. I really did because that that's where the equity really takes off. Yeah, you know, it's a big it, accelerator. It, yeah, it's, it, it goes from one level to the next. And I'll explain that here in a minute. And, uh, but uh, a lot of comes in right after New Year's and he says, hey, you, you got a minute to my office? I said, sure. <clears throat> he says, you would get your wish. I said, what's that? He said, I want to follow an Esalon. Nice. So follow an Esalon and, and spit the bear part with 13. Doing everything you need to do to get you ready to go to public. Uh, we built behind those credit squeeze, got in Blave London, helped help take us to that point. And then 
May 23rd of 2014 in New York. That was numbers they do want to call it. Did you go ring the bell? So back then there were so many options. They had to schedule this house. You rang the bell. Um, I think it was at Christmas of that year. Okay. You had to schedule it out. That had to be uh, fun. But so getting back to what an anomaly that was, and when we went public, I told you we were 900 million in debt. In the public, we were 9K subscribers. So, subscribe. so we paid off all our debt and then wow. got an, almost another billion dollars in cash in the bank. That's one wow. Where, was it the next year or the next couple of years, actually? Wow. And so, incredible. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. Um, second largest energy option ever next to Ontario Resources. So, literally, Bad Betty Bond became a billionaire. And wow. And it's billionaires. And, it's, <clears throat> and something like that. So, seems um, he got his 50 million. Yeah. Then <laughs> and then some is right. Travis. So one of where he got him on another cry from being inside of the battle all of hard work he put into it and or just being happy from something like that that, you know, doesn't come along very often, but that was the team he had in place was great. They were all top eight personalities. There were four of us that worked really hard and you bought it heads and but I, I think, you know, you and I talked about this. I think if you have a team of high fake personalities where you're both head, you're all headstrong and you want to make things happen, then there's something to be said to that type of environment that's really dry and you, you want to compete against that person and you want to get to do good. And at the same time, you got your own spin lane, you need to stay in. We had four specific people who stayed on task to make make something happen and you look back on it that was um come up all 11 years 10 years ago this year and um i think man i was so young back right then i was um i'm 57 now i was 47 then so when we started i was 42 brian was 32 so you know wow. pretty, yeah just and yeah it's a night giving sure to be same while but we we when you get our age, you think, yeah, how did I do that back then? You know, it's just very little, um, business sense, so to speak, at such a young age. But the thing is, when you're young, you take risks because you don't know. You don't know. You're not inhibited by what can't be done. You're only charging the hill. That's your only mode. And so we fast forward, we sold the company, um, uh, in 2021 to Brian's dad of all things. Yeah, for seven and a half billion. And um uh, I retired for a few months and then Brian had actually left the company in two thousand seventeen. He still had a board seat. Um but he uh left and retired. He's in the other sector's tougher than what people were all either absolutely love it or absolutely hate it, I think. <clears throat> I'm in the latter yeah. camp, by the way. Yeah. I've worked yeah. for publicly traded companies, privately owned, private equity backed. Yeah. You know, and they all, there's all, there's a devil in every room. You just got to pick the one that you want to dance with, you know? Exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, and as a, he said, I've followed the Ronald's last NDR on the road show in New York, and then we were there for a couple of days, and we walked out of the last um, road show speech, and it was kind of a business center, and, and as we walked out of the room, was through all the streets there in New York, and he has last one ball. He's selling and never had to do that again. Wow. And that just shows you the level of stress he was under. And he was just so happy at that moment. It was over, you know, for him. Yeah. And he was the wildest in the sunset and then I invest in real estate. <clears throat> well, he sold the company, and um, in December, uh, Plenty. Coming out of COVID, he, he calls me, he goes, Hey, uh, like Plumman that I mentioned earlier, took his photo of the coast suites. He said, It's got this new model for farming a company that only has company that's a little different. And this is what it is. And I, uh, he did a good investors with Craig Suites and he saw this 
this disconnect with certain oil and gas properties where they are very profitable, you know, where they're kind of over 25, 30 percent still on small um, companies that nobody wanted, but still great, you know, great returns. Yeah. He goes, I'm not making that in real estate. You know, you just can't get those kind of returns in the market. You can't get those kind of returns in real estate unless you invest in NVIDIA. But, yeah, uh, exactly. Um, and he explained it to me, and, and I said, oh, that's, he's a jet to teach in a low, come to that organization. Um, you know, it's going to become very solid. He likes, he likes a good culture and good team environment. The federal organization does that. He said, this is what you can make a lot of money. So if you come back to work with me, I said, I've been retired for two months. <laughs> now I need you. I said, okay. So came over and this year would be three years. They can wear license. They now in three years, what parsley energy was in six when we took it public. Holy cow. But you know, it was a different department. And you say, well, how did you grow that fast? Um, in that short period of time or sparsely and, and a lot of it is experience. And you got um, the moves down. Yeah, exactly. Got yeah. the connections, you know, the people that we invest in the community that we, we know that Brian knows and and certainly Blake knows and um well, they can run out of the lanes behind this thing company. But, you know, it takes, it takes three or four different people up top to, with certain skill sets, and I'm part of that skill set. What uh, specifically part. is your skill set? What is I'm it that on, you do? I'm on product and operations, but I'm also a product and engineering. Okay. Uh, product and operations is actually the Evadol driver and all the gas company. So, okay. You, my team gets the oil out of the ground, so to speak, and, okay. and uh, uh, takes care of a lot of the the minutia that is associated with gig production. I think it's a back to online, selling new wells or completing new wells. And that's sort of the one we the road, so to speak. My tell guys the out. audience, Paul, tell the audience how that works. So at a high level, yeah, you're responsible for getting the oil out of the ground. And that's everything from identifying the sites, you know, knowing the geo info of what's going on there, all the way down to like the equipment, you know, the people on the ground. Like how much of that do you own all the way down? Do you own down to the drill in the dirt? Like responsibility? Do you sub that out to other? Explain to the audience. How does that work? So we all, we sub all that out in the words of oil. And so you have okay. a contract drill or is it with throwing the raise? We all buy okay. We're just an actual producer. Okay. So, I'm stuck all that out through various um, vendor sources that we, we uh, hire Bruce to do. But we actually have, once you have an oil well online, and most people see up on Jack or gas well, once you yeah. have that online, that's our responsibility. You go on. Okay. Uh, but my guys on the field do that. And then it's just looking for the property as well to either high rate and, you know, maybe. Maybe there's some parties that are uh, either in a bankruptcy or um, had an operator that really wasn't a very good operator and, and aren't, they, they aren't making money off of it, where the other team is pretty efficient, the proven side for it is quite successful, so we're able to taste those properties and turn them around. And then, then there's some of this puppy, I could shoot with the Lincoln or even the private equity groups that know that company. Um, uh, take that to like soon and, and try to do some optimization on it to get production off or keep it flat. Yeah. Hey, how do you drill a few wells to, to get production, get all the bump of the brooch and then a year or two later, they'll flip it and sell it. Uh, that's what all those private equity companies do. Okay. okay. We call those companies that are that tiny have pump and done. So they'll, pump and, yeah, it's not only, that's not, uh. Exclusive to oil and gas, no pun intended. Yeah, that's what they, they call it. Of it. Yeah. Hey, hey, I want to unpack this a little bit more for the audience because, um, you know, I know very little about oil and gas. I've got a buddy I told you about when I met you, Zenit. Um, I've got another friend slash associate who's, who does a little bit of work in it, but not much, not like you do. Tell what happens like, you know, somebody owns land 
and you go and you determine that that land has probably got an opportunity you want to drill on it and then you go lease that land let's say that person has those mineral rights so you've you've cleared that hurdle how does the landowner participate how do they get paid do they get paid on production do they get an override like how does um, that work okay so Unfortunately, or of course, so there, there are some land on his own now. So I have a ranch and I own 51% of the mills on Very rare. Okay. So what happened over the course of the years, Vic, is just in general because of where we are in time. Back in the old Western days, yeah. you could come settle land. And what's unique about the United States is you tell the mills. So from yeah. the surface, which is you own that, all the way down the side of the earth, you own it. Whereas in foreign countries, the country owns it. Okay. So that's created a unique uh, situation where people become independently wealthy. Yeah. Which am in money. But as you can, as you know, over time, people die. They will let out. And that pyramid of family members grows over time. And so... What some family members have done is they've taken their mills and sold them over time. So okay. you just have a big pyramid of kill owners that's diluted, so to speak, and once the family has kept those mills in their family forever. So the first landowner owned the minerals, and then over right. time as the property had passed hands, yeah. the property was sold, but the minerals got diluted. That's, that's correct. And so you prepare on some landowners that, that still own mills. I think you know, yeah. all, there, there's very few of them that own 100%, but they're, they're at. Yeah. But, um, there's m ways to monetize those metals, and, and there's groups that, are, that all they do is go around and buy metal royalty interest. Let's call it royalty interest. Mm -hmm. And that's how they name their living those companies. They, they don't operate like we do, they don't try yeah. to get all gas out of the ground. They only own metals. We as an oil and gas operator have an accounting department that pays checks so when the revenue comes in from the oil and gas that we sell. Yeah. There are mineral owners that get, which is called mailbox money. Oh, yeah. They get a check. And they, some of those checks can be anywhere from hundreds of thousands of dollars to, you know, up in a half a month. Yeah, sure. And because your mineral rights are so small. It's so, amazing. Yeah, and so that's where these companies come in and they buy out these small groups. So some people say, man, I, it's not worth a stamp to, to send it to me. So I'll just sell my minerals. The problem with that is that um, a friend of mine had some minerals down in Pecos, Texas, and it was worthless for years. Well, he actually did not got a home and auto insurance, and I didn't know he had minerals there, but he, he calls me one day, he goes, Hey, you guys are drilling while I'm my family stuff down and hey, this cow. I said, Really? I didn't know you had minerals there. And he said, Well, I knew I did. He said, My mom wanted to take it, but I didn't know it was worth anything. And I was supposed to. And I, was, I said, You're probably going to get a piece of check. He said, I only got one. He said, It was 10 grand. I said, <laughs> 10 grand. Really? It's <laughs> fantastic. Said, he goes, uh, Is it going to be that way every month? And I said, No. So what was the client over time and that check will okay. be smaller over time. So I think that's you know, just depends on how many how how much acreage you have on Correct. So you fast forward out of that. So there's another way that that people get money through on the gas and that's working interest. So over time you mentioned it when you lease a service owner and someone drills on it, you gotta have investors, so that's for work interest owners come in. And then uh, you can do a hundred percent, but it's very rare. It's net revenue interest. There's very little of that left. But it's working interest and net revenue interest. It's a working interest for investors. And um, that's not mailbox money. Working interest is money that it costs to operate that you way or that lease. So you pay your proportionate share. So if they could say, hey, we got some. And this is what we get already on running up. We've got some work interest to pay If you want to invest in our company, you'll get work interest. Now you'll pay a joint interest billing every month, which is still up to you, but we can net you 
of your revenue. So if you get revenue from the oil and gas, the bills associated with taking care of that will be netted out of that. Whereas mineral interest, it's just a sole check. Yeah. I'm in minerals. So that's where that comes into play. Uh, the higher working interest that a company, oil and gas company can own, meaning they spend or for now money to maintain that well, but the more revenue they get, obviously they get to keep themselves and not go out for work or stuff. So that's, you know, that's another part of the component of that. So, you know, that's the accounting component. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's, it's not complex, but it's just, if you're not familiar with it, it can get very detailed. I moved to Texas in 2007. We moved in here in April, 2007. I don't think we were here a couple of months. And I get a letter from the homeowner association. Now, Paul, you gotta remember, I grew up in New York and New Jersey, like I don't know crap from mineral rights, never even heard of mineral rights. And so, and you know, I'd made my way to Colorado, no talk of mineral rights where I was. Come to Texas, everybody's talking about mineral rights. So I get a letter from the association and said, hey, we were approached by an oil and gas company they want to do some drilling and, you know, because of the, the horizontal drilling, you know, and they think we're going to, and they want to come under Timuron. Timuron's the area that I live in. That's a area of South Lake. And, um, you know, they're not going to put well sites, drilling sites in particular, it's going to be here and here. And they plotted this all around, but uh, we've negotiated. And if you want to sell your mineral rights, this is how much it is per acre. Yeah. Not sell, sorry. Three year lease. Oh, lease. Okay. Yeah. Three year lease. That's three right. year lease. You want a three year lease, your mineral rights. This is how much it is. So I calculate. I'm like, oh, we're going to get a free, like 10, I'm going to get 10 grand here for like, uh, welcome to Texas, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. So we fill out the form. I email it in. Uh, and maybe a week goes by, I get a check. Okay. $10,001 and whatever. It's just right over 10,000 bucks. So I put four grand aside for taxes and I take $6,000 and I go to the Apple store. I'm like, we, we need all new computers in the house. This is free money. We're going to go, we're going to pull the rip cord. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And so a month later, they stop issuing checks. There was a brawl between the town and this company that came in and they said they were going to drill in certain spots in a certain fashion. And then after further research, they realized they couldn't do it where and how they wanted to. So they wanted to move the drilling sites to other places and the town said, no, you can't do that. Yeah. And so they stopped issuing new leases, you know, new, new, new for those three years. And uh, they stopped issuing money and they didn't claw anything back. They couldn't claw it back. So yeah. that, that was my introduction to oil and gas. And it's like, hey, you mean every time I move to Texas in a new house, I'm gonna write me a check for 10 grand? I'm gonna keep moving, this is great. And that, uh, the beauty of horizontal integration, I say horizontal integration, the, the technology could grow horizontally. Yeah. It's situations like that. If it, as a matter of fact, we had two well ladies who live in Arizona, retired, living on fixed income, but they had forgotten they had minerals out in West Texas, but their dad had moved to them. He passed wow. away. Okay. And then they're living on Social Security and Medicare. Rough life. You know, there we have what's called a deck and it shows on no honors, spark interest honors. Uh huh. And it goes out to the eighth decimal place in terms oh, really? of really okay. Yeah. But there was a suspicion enough that um they thought it was worthless and then just forgot about it. Well, we're able to locate people like that. Okay. Court records. So you just go to the little bit of house and and you need all the court records and find these people. And you start sending them checks. And if you can't find them, then, one, then the money's going to what's called a suspense account. Yeah, I'm and familiar time, with that. They have two or three million dollars in suspense just waiting on trying to find people who have that money rolled in. So the companies, well, all, every oil and gas company has a suspense account. Well, let me jump in there for a second because for people who are listening, it's not only oil and gas that dump, that dump into these suspense accounts, it's everybody. So yeah. if you go out to these unclaimed property websites, that's it. Yeah. You know, you go out and you look it up and it's funny that you mentioned this. I don't know what it was. You know, I check every now and then. And for my days in the music business and having moved a number of times and you think you got all your address changes straight. It's back yeah. in the days when I get checks. 
I did a search on my name in Texas, my name in Colorado, my wife's name, my kids' names. I think re- I, in the in the last month we've submitted uh, unclaimed property and we've got almost four thousand dollars of like lost found money. You know, yeah. and then and then I start. You know, I get on a company call and I'm like, hey guys, check this out. And I put in one of my partners' number. He's got nothing. No, no, he's got eighty bucks. And then I said, everybody go out to this website after the call. And I want to report back for who went, found what. I found 75. I found 100. I found, but I was definitely the, uh, the big winner. And it was because there was some publishing money ch- checks that just went to these suspense accounts. So for anybody listening, go look up unclaimed property for your state. You'll find a link. You'll put in your name first and last. Uh, if you, if it asks the town, put it in where you lived at the time and you will get a list of names and you'll be shocked that I guarantee 90% of people out there got a hundred bucks out there coming their way. Well, and, and the other thing to worry about it too, is that this type of situation we had in America, this is, just, this is what makes America so great, is these two elderly ladies, and this is just a story of many. Yeah. They had no idea, so they fall on our curse and a land karma. So the land karma is what takes care of all of this. Okay. And they call our land manager and they sit and her name is Stephanie and I say, Stephanie, is this is this right? This check and the check is twenty five grand. <laughs> and she, I love she, this story even more. She goes, Yes, man, that is correct. And she goes, we completely forgot about these medals and and they don't let off they stay kind of sister and I've been living together for ever since we retired right in our mid sixties. And um They hired her an extra pool boy that month. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, Is this what we're gonna get every month? And she's well no man, that was the calling over time, you know, that they are yeah. just open stick it and and that's why we you know, companies drill all the time to keep her yeah. And they were just in complete awe and happy and overjoyed. And they stopped by our office. So let them build in Texas of all places from Arizona. Holy cow. Wow. To thank us. But then they were all on their way to Dallas and now on their way to send their else to go on a cruise. They had never been on a cruise. So her oh my gosh. That's amazing. And now, you know, just to take it even a step further, now, I'm done field tours with uh, the Chinese. Or Russian contingency and Iraqis back when when they took out Saddam Hussein, but the, the Russians broke down did a tour with it. They they couldn't successfully understand what we were doing. So they're an interpreter, a means of pre I explained to them. I just explain to you about land yeah, and yeah. these how we drill wells and how you as a as a land one were possibly going minerals. Oh, they all on my board and explained it to him. And one of the Russian individuals stood up in the middle of my uh, teaching moment. Yeah. And he's doing his hands like this and smiling. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's going, Congress. And then he's, he, I don't know what he says after that. Yeah. That's the trail tire. I said, What did you just say? And he said, This is the run against the American race. <laughs> That's so great. Yes. And it, oh it was just, my God. You know, that is so great. They can set for this, you know, I'll just say the owns the, the yeah. land, minerals. And so conceptually, they couldn't understand it. But it, it was, it's a very planned moment for me back then. I was in my mid 30s back then to see that. And I knew, and she felt how I'm these group of people who, who I would experience freedom or the fruits of success of owning land. And so, again, it's, it's the beauty of America. And as, as an example, it's, it's what provides jobs that, and tax resources, our annual loan taxes that we pay every year on this yeah. revenue uh, is huge. To, it's a boon to some of these smaller towns. There's some small uh, communities that, uh, out in West Texas that have artificial turf on the football fields. It's just fan football. Exactly. And, Beautiful locker room, and all the students get a new iPad every year for a small, small school because of the ad valorum and tax revenue that goes wow. to the school system. So it's, it's beautiful for for schools. It's great for individuals who get to make nice, great for individuals who start companies. And so 
be Kaylee Tina if one of our resize, I gave her a tour and just as an example, being a follower, I said, Nikki, if you look at this one draw side, I did the same thing with uh, Will Hurd, um, coach them Will Hurd, who, okay. who was a Democrat, I said, hey, everything from San Antonio out to Pennsylvania, and Rick Trip, I told the same thing. He's drawing Rick, but not, and it's not to see people on a location, but they supply and form it. And you know, just the ancillary people associated sure. with Well, 1,000 people were drawing Rick. Wow. What it takes to learn not only the business style of it, but, you know, some combined time or drilling a well or shoe on your rig. Um, That's incredible. Any, any That's a of, big stat. Supply, yeah, any kind of supplies that go with that. And, and then the accounting and associated with it, so there's accounting of people with each business associated with that. There's at least a thousand people with Tom Hall for rig. That's amazing. And How do people find out if they own minerals? I mean, you know, or, you know, I think when we first met, you asked, I told you I had a little tiny piece of land out in Moran. You asked me if I own the, lim the minerals. And I remember negotiating with the guy. He's like, oh, but I got to keep the minerals. I'm like, listen, I'm already overpaying for the property. I got to have the minerals. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> he was a very, um, how could I explain it and be courteous and kind? Um, he was just not a very sophisticated guy. Yeah. Okay. And so we, I, we hired a lawyer at my expense, a guy who he knew. So we had a whole trust thing going and he walked us through the wholesale process and filed all the deeds at the county and did all of this other stuff. And we wrote in the paper that I had the minerals, but, and that the, the, the deed got recorded and all the, the stuff that need to happen. But is there a site somebody can go to? To say, yeah. hey, let me put the address of my house in and see who owns the minerals. They're allowing you to do that. Um, it's, it's registered in the county under the in title. So, you know, for it's me, under the title. Yeah. So for me, now I'm going to rob all my rich. Yeah. I got a title search done on it. And, yeah. Uh, but prior to that, it's usually the saying you need to make a purchase, metals are conveyed or metals are not conveyed. Correct. And he said, metals are conveyed. And I said, wow, that's, that's good. I said, probably nothing, you know, maybe one or 2%. Well, I looked at it and I asked the, the title lady, I said, is that right? It says 51%. Taking one percent means you've got the executive rights. That's right. You to tell them that whether they can drill or not. And, um, but think one percent is unheard of. I mean, you know, there's one or two percent here or there. And I said, is this correct? She said, yes, sir. That's been searched for research and, and it's correct. We, we can find everything before you get ready to sign. And I yeah. said, he's paying the medals to me. And she said, he is. So in no additional cost. I yeah, that's great. And so that's, that's great. They, is there they, any oil or gas out by us out there? Where you are? Yeah. Yeah. Moran and Abilene, you know, oh, any, yeah. anything out there? Really? Yeah. And it's been in the past and it's years ago, Exxon drilled nine to 10 miles on that place, but it's, it's already healed over, so to speak. You can't, okay. I don't see if you do or call my place with those, the piece of art, I've found someone. Okay. Uh, Are the rigs been... still there? No, no. They yeah. were plucked down bad in years okay. ago. Trees have already grown over the little kids, but there's still. I had a geologist approach me about two years ago when I was drilling my place. And really? Yeah, the well was tank and he pulled out and decided not to, not to do it. But, oh, I would have sound the dial on at least me. And, yeah. And you know what I, I want to find? <clears throat> I want to find one of those old school, you know, the little tiny rigs? Yeah. And I want to put it on the inside of my fence at the entrance, but I want to hook up an electric motor to it. Yeah. And just have it. Oh, they're everywhere, right? You, oh, you, I, I can't find them. Ah. If you come across one, let me know. I want yeah, to find I'll, one of those. Yeah, I can find those. They're everywhere. I, real old school, like, you know, yeah. the rustier, the better. And something wow. I could probably break down and put in the back of a pickup truck or something would be great. Ooh, I don't know, even the small <laughs> one. Oh, uh, that one is the reality. But, oh, uh, really? What do you, what do you think they, they run to find one of those? Oh, I don't know. They're, they're pretty much. It's just junk, no price. Okay. Because you right. can, you know, they're, they're easy to rebuild. So that, yeah, exactly. Take it apart. Yeah. 
So that would be great. Ah, yeah, you know what? You've uh, you've invigorated my sense of American patriotism here tonight, Paul. But it's true. There are so many great things about this country, but just people take them for granted. You know, you, you got the, the yeah. guys from Russia telling you, "Wow, this was what makes America great." Yeah, because you own to the center of the earth, underneath your soil, right? And so, yeah. you know, the minerals, you're right, in many other countries are, and that's what's making many other countries wealthy and keeping everybody around them poor is, right. uh, is that kind of thing. Well, and, and the other thing, too, is I still experience it here in Austin. You know, obviously Austin's a little more um, liberal, per se, in yeah. other areas of Texas. But uh, when I was with Austin Energy, I had a, a lady at a store. She said, uh, she said, can I have your email address for where it was. I said, sure. I said, it's kind of long. And Paul Treadwell at the time. Paul Treadwell at personateenergy.com. You have a lot that, you know, rather than try to stall it out, I handed her a business card. Uh -huh. and she just copied it. And she goes, first thing, and if you go, kind of energy is that? And I said, okay, here we go. Yeah, okay. I said, uh, hey, uh, well, I guess. And then she goes, <laughs> Oh, you're one of those. <laughs> Great. Said, what does yeah. that mean? She said, you're, you're one of those companies that poison their water. And so, oh. said, okay. Okay. Uh, so I explained to her how you drove it on, how you case it. And there's three strings of pipe and there's cement between each string and how it seals off. We have, there's, we have to get a water board lever, which is the permit from the TCEQ of Texas. And, you have to protect the water zones that we drill through. Okay. And there's three strings of pipe with seen in. It's heavy wall pipe. Like, and in some cases, it's anywhere from 13 to 11 pounds per foot. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So what, what diameter do you start with? 13 and 5 eighths. And, and then, then comes down to what? 7 inch and then, uh, and then 5 and a half. Okay. So you got the 13 and 5 eighths, the 7 inch, and in between the 7 and 13, you got poured concrete? Yeah, you have to pump semen and change one. Wow. So you've got the sheet of semen outside the 13 and 5 eighths. Yeah. Three hard grain zones. And okay. you've got 7 inch, which is heavy tight, and semen in between the 13 and 5 eighths and 7 inch. And then you run under 5 and a half as your production string, and you got yeah. semen. You know, so you got semen, pipe, semen, I have semen, pipe. Wow. And, and I explained that to her, and I actually drew it. I bought ten pan. I drew her a diagram on the back of a piece of paper, and she goes, "Our water shouldn't be poisoned at all with that." Yeah, exactly. No one's ever explained it to me like that. She said, "That's great." And yeah. I said, "Well, how do you not ever researched it yourself?" She goes, "No, because I I wouldn't have understood the way he was explaining it." She said, "There's no way that our water should get poisoned. It, it shouldn't." But headline news. Headline news. Yeah, whatever, whatever wants to be told, we can, we, you'll believe anything we tell you. Well, and not to her. Good. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of the same thing. We all are, you know, we, and, you know, I saw a, uh, who was it? Um, sports commentator's name is uh, escaping me. <clears throat> He's sort of coming back toward the middle of the road. I like middle of the road people anyway, but he basically says, they, they asked him, what do you, what do you think of this? And he said, you know, rather than tell you what I think of this, I'm going to tell you that if you give me a set of facts that I can verify is accurate and true, I will then offer you my opinion on what I think of those facts. The right. problem we have is that I can't get a set of information that I can verify as facts. He said, That's because true. we're flooded with it's Political different. jockeying, opinion, disinformation, whatever we want to call it, all to work to the benefit of some angle somebody's trying to to accomplish. Well and said. Often, yeah, well, and often if you follow the money, you know exactly where it's coming from. So there, there you go. That's you know, it. Is that. what it is. So we, get, we got a good lesson on mineral rights, which is really, really cool and great. Um, my, my, my friend Walter was a land man. <clears throat> um, Walter Beams. Um, he has since passed. He was, he got ill last year and mm. just went suddenly young guy in his mid to upper fifties. Um, and I met him through, uh, we have a hunting lease on his property. And so that's how I met Walter and became friends, but he was a land man, you know, just went around doing his thing and, and, uh, lived out in Albany. 
So, yeah. you know, I had moved from Dallas, had a family property out there. I think they had, I think there were four or six of them that each had uh, 620 acres apiece. Oh, wow. And, yeah. you know, and then you know, his sister sold off. He kept his, his uncle had a piece. It was in his family trust. Right. But if you pass, it stays in the trust. So there's, they, even though he was married, the property goes back to the trust and goes elsewhere in the, uh, in the family tree. But his property is cool in that it's got an old gravesite on it. And they, somebody, I don't know if it was him or the, uh, it's called the Hickman Ranch. And the gate still says Hickman. Uh, clearly, it's not been owned by Hickman in a million years. And there are a couple of cool things about his piece is that he's got this, he's got this graveyard on it. It's got, I'm going to say, 10 tombstones on it, tops. It's got a tree in the middle of it. And then they put a little chain link fence around the area just to, to gate yeah. it off, to, 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 pre to preserve it. Um, and the last time I was there, we were out uh, checking for checking on the hogs, as they say. Uh -huh. And um, <clears throat> I said to, I was there with my son and one of his friends, and I said, we're coming back and we're bringing gear next time we come here. And when we come, the gear is going to be different than what you think. It's going to be chainsaws and weed whackers and buckets and water and brushes. And we are cleaning this up. Oh, wow. Yeah. We are cleaning this up. And I said, um, there's history here. I said, we got we to gotta do it justice. These are, you know, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, that kind of thing. Um, all young people, you know, who was 21, who was 18. I think the oldest person in that, in that uh, grave site made it to 30. You know, TV was long running rampant back then. And really? Seeing some old cemeteries were wiped out a whole family. And, and wow. It actually said it on the tombstone, two stones of each family member. Said what they died of? It did. And oh, you know, I'll have to get a closer look. Um, no, it's, right. yeah, that, they, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of cemeteries where you can see that. Uh, and then the other cool thing about this, the other cool thing about this property is there's an old outpost. So oh, this wow. evidently a trail went through this property and there's a stone building. The roof has since caved in and it might be 15 by 20, but all the original stone perimeter is up. And evidently as people were migrating West, this was like a trading post. So I'll see a stop along the way. I've had before here in Texas and, and more often not, there's a water source nearby. So a lot of times it, there'll be either a stream. There's a, yeah, there's a creek about yeah. uh, 75 yards from that yeah. trading post. Yeah. You know, I actually found a pretty solid lot place to it in, but it was. Really? A sun I found it. There was a, a stub pole and a rectangle with locks. And now on that stub pole was a broken coffee cup. Huh. So, Dad, what is, what is this? I, said, I think it's a grave site. Yeah, you know, it just has that look. And, you know, Not marked? Like, no name? No no tombstone? Yeah. So Ashley and I went up there in the pike one day and yeah, took a cross out there that she had uh, a pretty good size on. Yeah. And, uh, found for you one that have had some of this That's house. cool. But, uh, yes, yeah, you know, there's, there's no telling how many of those are, are out there. It's oh, just, yeah. This one, you see this one from Google Earth, actually. It's pretty neat. You know, oh, you wow. can, yeah. and it's actually, it's funny. You, um, you know how there are various marks on, you know, Google Earth or maps, or whatever. It says Greer Cemetery. So oh. it's actually somebody, somebody dotted it and recorded it over time. And the name on the majority of the, uh, the tombstones in that place is Greer. Cool thing about love yeah, you. It's cool. I mean, you, you kind of, this talk makes me want to look up a little bit, see if I can find a history of the people that lived out there. Yeah. But Texas got a lot of cool history, a lot of great stuff going on. So you said, I'm going to take us back a little bit. You said you went to some college. Did you go? Did you graduate? Did you jump in oil and gas? Like, what happened back then? So, uh, I got an associate's degree. Um, actually, was going to finish up. I got a full ride, actually, um, for being on the dean's list every semester. Um, to finish up at um, was Texas State, because now it's Texas Bay and in Canyon, Texas. And um, I sat out at Stellar my last semester in college. I went to work. And the gas industry at night, 
for company and, and uh, working evenings because um, I was paying my all the way through college, paying for long books. Like a young kid shouldn't do, I, I purchased a vehicle um, the summer after I graduated. So now okay. I had a car payment, a new insurance payment. So I was still in school and I, and I did it, you know, but I had to work a lot. Um, but that semester I, I was working uh, and I saw more money coming into my pocket than I'd ever seen before. What I thought was a lot of money. Sure. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'm going to work this summer. I think I'm going to sit out because the, the scholarship didn't expire for, uh, I think it was, back then it was like 12 months. I had this side. Well, that turned into 37 years later. And I saw, I just had an associate's degree, but yeah. you know, I, I worked hard, did a lot of experience in a short amount of time. Brian heard about me at Pioneer. I went on to work for them, I went to work for them in 1992. Was then, he was saying, of course, the time I developed a reputation. Well, I had the better kind of knowledge of what I did and, you know, how to set the skill set up that he needed and why. And a lot of it, too, is um, just a colorful I'll tell you, too. We, we both had the same mindset of what we wanted. We were talking about some force of energy and, and had that good culture and, and had a people who were assigned to come to work every day. You know, the last thing we want to do, you go work is to feel oppressed and yeah. be down and and micromanaged and, um, and we try to hire people at back then and still do, you know, if you have to micromanage someone, I mean, you and I talked about this the other night, if they you are. have to micromanage someone, then, then you don't need them. Right. You hire people who do a specific job, a specific task, and you hire that talent for that. And if they're good at it, you don't need to browbeat them. And we just need to know what's going on. They need to keep you up to date, but you've hired them for that specific skill set why you need to crush them and, and you know create a environment that is not enjoyable so our work environment is, is i wouldn't say it's a little bit we have very thorough meetings and there's lots of excitement around there that's comfortable but we don't beat people up to you know you must do this if they shake your eyes you must need yeah we, we just don't do that and and I hope Obviously. more people listen to this and listen to that. Um, you know, it's funny because I would say uh, you're going to be show 24. I've had some pretty successful people on the show. I've been very fortunate to have, you know, attracted people who want to help me build a channel, you know, and been gracious with their time with me um, and love telling their story. And like, yeah, you know, shit, I've learned so much just in, in 24 shows about so many different things. Why well, I love it. But I, I, I have a similar story, although I didn't even make it to the associate's degree. I went to some college. I had an opportunity in the music business. I told you a little bit about it. I popped yeah. out. And then when it popped me out, I was like, okay, I got some choices. I can go back to college. I can lever the skills I have in some other place in some other way. And if I go back to college, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to be a chiropractor. That's what I'm going to yeah. do. Yeah, because I was... Just, I just, I loved it. I loved the manipulation of the body and I, I thought, thought I would be really great at it. But I got into technology because it seemed like an easier leap for me and that everything I was doing in the recording studio was coming, you know, technologically driven. And I was mm. building recording studios and I learned a lot from my brother and signal flow and wiring. He used to bring me along on jobs. He's an engineer in the radio business. So he would build and modify radio stations and aside from working at, uh, you know, the big market radio stations. And so I leveraged that in technology and then all of the things that you just went through about treating people right. I learned that stuff from my, my grandparents and my parents, right. you know, from a good solid upbringing and treating people right. And then you start seeing how people respond. You know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. And you can't smash everything with an L, you know, exactly. some, some people need a bear hug, but I, but I agree with you wholeheartedly about hiring talent. If you got to hire people that you need to micromanage, um, you, you gotta, you gotta move on. On the other yeah. hand though, it becomes rough. And I'm, let me just finish this story. I had a guy that worked for me 
who was a super hard driver. This guy, I, I, think, I don't think the guy worked any less than 16 hours a day because he would leave the job and he loved it so much. He would like connect up when he got home and just he would geek out all night long and he just loved it, right? He never asked for overtime. He didn't do it because we were behind. He just, he just loved it. And it was a time he was super young, single, right? It was, it was perfect for him. And so when we would hire people, his bar of commitment became his own personal bar for measuring people. Yeah. And I finally had to say to him, I said, hey, Eddie, Eddie, listen, this guy here, like he's meeting expectations. He's not exceeding expectations and he's not a needs improvement guy, but he is flat out meeting expectations. I said, now, if you go down a list of, of people in very, very large organizations, 80% of your crew is going to be meets or, or meets minus. It's probably going to be 75 meets, 5% meets minus, and 20% yeah. exceeds. I said, that's just why certain people get promoted and move up and other people don't. I mean, there's, it's there. I said, but we need the meets expectations people. We need them. Because yeah. finding a thousand of these people that are all, you know, in the, in the top category, going to be very hard. And so I'm not sure how big your current organization is. People like, how do you, how do you deal with that? And at what level is meets okay for you? Um, but, you know, you said, you know, just thought, as a matter of fact, I had a guy that I had a new, um, probably five years ago at, at my prior company and, and I sense hired him here. He's one of those individuals who is tall, but he doesn't want to manage people. And yeah. at the time we were women we hire him back in, he said, I need you to have a position where you're going to eventually manage the oh, I don't want to manage people. I've yeah. done it. He's not got a great skill set. He's on, I'm not going to be shy about that. And I said, Oh, I know. I've heard about you. I've seen your resume. We've done our investigating work on it. And he said, that's all I want to do. He said, I don't want to deal with drama. And I said, we've got to put it down to you. I said, let's hire that guy. <laughs> because, you know, he, of course, you want to motivate people. And he's motivated. Yeah. Yeah. He's motivated to do the task at hand. That's what we want. You know, do you, his you, thing. And, but, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty as hey, well, as you're saying, about I was younger, I worked hard, I, I, I wanted to pass everybody up, and, and I, I did all that, and I would get a little aggravated if somebody didn't keep up with me. Guilty or, as charged here as well. And, you know, and there's, you learn the hard way that, that, to your point, there are people that are needed that, that just aren't like that. And there's people that are just wired that way. They keep their job in. They don't create any kind of situation where it's, uh, uh, they create a trauma or they get, they get everything done and needs to be done and, and no issue whatsoever. And then I'm they, I love those people. I, I need them in my organization. We, we sold parsley. We had a little over 500 people and, and, uh, here we're already up to half of that amount, but we're across the side. Wow. So it, it does create some strains and, and what well, and people and what I've learned, and not big, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, I'm just from managing people. But what I looked at is, is people's when when we're short handed, so to speak, or, or people feel like they're or they look like they're getting overloaded. Mm -hmm. But I change, um, they become short tempered, I know they become aggravated. It's a total personality switch. And then I'll just throw people in and, and I'll say, Hey, are you okay? And a lot of times, my really hard workers will say, yeah, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel overloaded? Do you feel like you could use some help? Yeah, you know. So, communication is key. And it goes back to this, that no one cares what you know until they know that you care. Yeah, I love and that. I, I don't care who you are. If you don't care about your people and you don't look at what's part of mine in their work life, then I don't think you're a good leader. You need to constantly be looking at your folks and, and helping them along, talking to them, I began opening the phone and develop that communication at our core 
you know, I've had over the years, of course, the several years of managing people, and people actually love that. Of course, they back to that. They they know that I care. Yeah. And when you care about them, they actually become a lot efficient because they feel motivated to come over. They feel motivated to do well for you. It's just like you know, being a parent having new kids are motivated, and you and you as they do chores around the house where you give them tasks to do and you tote on about it, they want to do more. And you used to show me it. You do appreciate what they do. And I do appreciate what people do around here and, and the extra mile that some of my folks go to to get things done. So um it's learning more about talking to people and uh, getting them to open up and, and what it does to them and informs you to where your shortcomings are in your organization. Whether it be, hey, oh, this is a little small on, and this is what could be better. Oh, okay. So we got to break down in our process flow. So we're starting a company that every company has its own favorite print, so to speak, of how they do things. Yes. And yeah, I don't care who you are. They're, they're always all going to be different to some degree. Yep. Are you different here in three years? We kind of have been my way through that. And what I found having worked at and built this company in RC with my team. Um, if you talk to people and team that out and say, hey, where are we lacking here? This there's, there's a bust in our process here. Where are we missing it? So if you're counting volume, I want to hear their ideas for making uh, continuous improvements and building this organization. So when you still, when people's all you know, buying in and they have an opinion and they feel like their opinion matters, it's amazing how your culture just grows and, and becomes even more embodied where they're bringing people in. And they don't really eat, they'll be loyal to you. Especially when their opinion turns into something you execute and deliver. No. Because then they turn from workers to owners. Yeah. It's like, I did that. That was my idea. Yeah. They, they listened to me. They asked me. Like, that's the first hurdle. They asked me. Yeah. They listened. Second hurdle. Third one is they evaluated and thought it was a good idea and what the hell are we doing it now? And I can come in every day and know that this improvement is something. And what it does, it sparks that creative juices. They're going to start looking for more stuff to make better. Yeah. yeah. All day, every single day, they're going to they're gonna look for stuff to make better. Hey, you know, this, I, you probably have seen this as well. I keep saying that because we're about saying that age, but. I'll tell you that there's a, I saw this while I was younger. Oh, no, we can't put you in that position because you're too young. Mm-hmm. Um, thousands, sheer, like 10 years, nothing against people who are older. There's just a certain thing who runs for youthful people being around here who had got upon ideas they have already considered before, but they have a different approach to it. Oh, yeah. They have a different mindset to it. And you want to see that youthful exuberance. And I've had one particular individual who I knew they were going to go down a rabbit trail. I really did. Just based on my experience. And it was probably going to be somebody that said, why, do you let, why didn't you let them do this? I let them go down that path and they learned a lot from Doing absolutely a lot of data analytics and, and it didn't really the data analytics that are going to provide me really wasn't going to be useful. I knew that's where they were going with it, but I didn't stop them. I didn't hit it down. I let them yeah. go that route. And as through the course of meetings and going through their data, and the and it's great. It was useless. You know, yeah. just no, oh, that's unfortunate. This individual comes into me one day and. And uh, they said, all that data in that meeting really wasn't, didn't, wasn't useful for our business and, and what we're trying to accomplish. And I said, no, it wasn't. And I was, and they said, well, I've been working on that for two months now, and you didn't shut me down. And I said, well, here's the thing. How much did you learn from doing all that? Oh, I learned a lot. What else did you learn? She said, I learned about the business a whole lot better. Yeah. And, and I, she said, I'm going to be better for it. I said, now, had I inhibited you, 
Don't do that. You're wasting your time. That's not what our business is about. What would you have thought? He would have crushed me. And I said, exactly. I said, so you learn something from it. You take a better data analytics person because of it. You saw in the meetings what worked and what didn't work. And you brought some ingenuity. You actually brought processes that we're using still. I'm not going to stop your ingenuity and your drive to crush and say, Speechless, I'm not going to do that. It wastes some time, I'm sure it did, they, but it's kind of like Tom Watson said without any him. He had, you know, when those computers first came out, he had an employee that created this thing that had never cost a screen if you open to it. To one employee, it's the heaven for a dead egg, really, and never cost yeah. a screen race. Well, it was a mini virus, is what it was. <laughs> so people started passing yeah. around and thinking every computer would well, cost IBM over a million dollars to get it up. And they asked Tom about it, and he said, Tom, why, why did you not fire that individual? He said, Why would I fire that individual? I just spent a million dollars training. <laughs> so, you know, that's you, unbelievable. I, I think I know that, you know, I mean, yeah. And, of course, they didn't cost us any money doing it, but just the knowledge that they gained from it. And, and not only that, here's the thing that talking about morale and good culture. Yeah. And work and stuff that for me about hopefully that they can pay forward our leadership and, and allowing ingenuity to take place. And, um, I, I really got more joy and satisfaction out of that than I did anything. You know, I was, uh, I was in the music business when I was a young guy, <clears throat> wrote a lot of songs, did a lot of co-writing and you learn a lot through the collaborative process because, you know, you could walk in and maybe you're writing with one or two other people, depending on what the day brings. And that, that process usually starts with, well, what do you got? What do you got? What are you working on? Nobody's got a full song. Like you got a little spark, you got a little idea. What comes at the end of that writing session is something none of you would have created alone, first and for foremost, because one idea spawns another, spawns another, you know? And so what you did for this person is you, you allowed these connective dots and the brain firing to happen, even though the result wasn't great the first time, that's okay. Because yeah. aside from everything they've learned about the business and the approach and how to get at the data and the analytics and the tools and all of these things, you connected things in their brain. You allowed that to connect and that build the creative process and the critical thinking process. Not many people would have, have afforded that individual for that. So anybody listening, they're going to find out, I get in touch with you. They're going to be applying for jobs in five minutes after we release the show in August. But, um, you know, I have a test that I have built uh, for the people I work with now. And it's a, and this really lets me know what's going on at the company. It's the easiest thing. I don't need a survey. Um, I don't need to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and ask you how you're doing. It's a simple question. And I, and I got this from my own work stress over the years because I remembered how I felt. But first, I'm going to tell you the test, and I'm going to tell you how I came up with it. I call it the Sunday test. I don't want to know how you're feeling Monday at work, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Eh, maybe I'd be interested to know what you're feeling like at 3 o'clock on a Friday because it feeds into the Sunday test. The Sunday test is how's your Sunday going? What are you thinking about? When I worked at a very big bank, um, I worked my ass off, and it was a very um, no-mistakes environment. I led a lot of people. I had 1,100 people in my organization. We were spread out in 27 cities and three countries, and Every mistake was deemed a, you know, like, like a death sentence. It was critical and the place was wound up like a top. And um, I used to remember on Friday exactly how I felt at around three o'clock was like, I made, it. Yeah. I made it through the week. I'd go to bed Friday night. I'd have a pretty clear head. I would try to catch up on a lot of sleep and enjoy Saturday to the best of my ability because on Sunday, the stress would kick in. Yeah. Now, even though you were supposed to get a couple of days off on the weekend, um, first of all, I didn't make anything of my week during the week. I was just, you know, leaving at seven and getting home at seven at night, and I was exhausted. But um, I felt like I felt fully stressed and full of anxiety on a Sunday because 
clearly I was not looking forward to the week ahead. And then time, a lot, a lot of time after that, um, and I, I tried not to create that in my organizations. Like I hope nobody who worked in my organizations felt that way, but I did. Yeah. And I just certainly didn't force anybody to feel that way. Matter of fact, I would have people that say, I'd call on a Friday afternoon and say, hey, can, can you get me a report on X, Y, and Z? And they go, you'll have it Saturday morning. I'll, give it, you'll get, I'll get it done and you'll get it Saturday by 10 a.m. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't need it on Saturday. I don't need you to work on it right now. How's close a business on Monday? I said, I'm not going to do anything with it over the weekend. And having you, you know, work all night on a Friday, miss something, not take your kids somewhere Saturday morning, there may be a time I ask you for something like that, and I'll let you know, and it's because I will need it for something I'm being asked for immediately. But now is not one of those times. And so I like to ask people now, because of my own experience, how's your weekend? What did you do on Sunday? How were you feeling? And I kind of tell them this story to, to pluck out of them. Like, I just, I want you feeling great until Monday morning. Like, yeah, I get it. You pregame, you got your head in it, thinking about what you're going to do, but I don't want you to stress over it. Because if you hate your job or you hate coming to work or something that bad is happening, we're all doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. You're, you're doing something wrong by staying here. You know, I'm doing something wrong by how we're treating you or keeping you here. So the Sunday test is, is a great one. And I have some friends who work at the pretty big bank still, and they fail the Sunday test every week. They fail it, but they, they're stuck with these uh, blinders yeah. on. They can't see, you know? Seth, right on set, and that's what I was thinking about when you were describing it. But, okay, they're stuck. Yeah. And, they're, and, you know, it's kind of gay. And I was the same way out here. I mean, I loved working there, but they, they were being on loyalty. And I was developing this thing where right? I mentally were, oh, I don't want to leave this company. I don't want to leave, you know. Yeah. I was failure. I want to be loyal. Um, gosh, dang, if, if you're feeling like that on Sunday, are you really being loyal? I mean, is it is that healthy for you? Is that healthy for your family? You're not loyal to your family, I'll tell you that and much. Not yet. People steer them to change, or they're they're they have a lot of change. So it's it's that it's not all done for for Brian. Good Brian, I should say. Do you or a better teammate? People at on the air told me they said, "Oh, what are you doing?" You're about to get this huge promotion when your supervisor retires and this great career going, you work hard. Are you crazy? And uh, I said, I think I am. No. <laughs> because I felt stuck in some regards. And I thought, now here's an opportunity to lock on the start of oil and gas company. And I don't want to be stuck yeah. in that position. And I mean, I mean, people were great. Upward management was small. Uh, and actually, saw me higher up executive brought me to Dallas and tried to talk me out of it. And, and I appreciated that. Wow, the opportunity that was before me. And I did not ever really get something I've had, but, but challenge yourself to go earn those opportunities. And, and you know, this dead in football instance is big where I'm taking massive hate cuts to go do something. But yeah, the war later on, mainly for my mental health and spiritual well being, emotional well being was so much better. Yeah. And that's the thing. If you're feeling stuck on, on a Sunday, that's, that's not going to long term. It's not. We could probably have an entire podcast conversation about feeling sure. stuck and getting out of the rut because. As I look out amongst the sea of humanity that's in front of us, um, I see less and less real smiley, happy faces. There's something I mentioned on the, on the last podcast. I like bringing it up a lot because I, I think I'm not alone in this feeling and certainly wasn't alone. I, um, I'm a pretty positive guy. You know, I'm a big self-awareness guy and sort of uh, built myself up. Uh, I, can't know, what's that? I can't stand what's that? I want to be around it. I, yeah, I like exactly. I think this is why you're not hitting off, man. Probably. And so. Is he going back and forth? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy. People <laughs> comment standing next to us. <laughs> yeah. But um, 
I uh, I often will start, you know, think about something for I get up early and I love the morning hours and I love the quiet of the early morning. I make a cup of coffee and I make sure my first hour is just sitting and thinking. Yeah. And sometimes I'm doing that with a laptop up. Sometimes I'm not, but I'm not, but I'm exploring while I'm thinking. I'm trying to find something to see the day. And I will come across a quote, a video, something I read in a, in a, in a, in a magazine or a book or something that will really make me feel great, make me feel great. And I'll take that excerpt and depending on the, the platform, LinkedIn, my Instagram, something I will put it out there with, make it a great day, right? And it'll be something that's thought provoking and, or something that'll make you think and go, wow, life, life's pretty good. And I, I mentioned this on the last one. I'll say it again. I had a friend who would call me and go, ah, you, you make me sick. How are you so positive? I don't know what's going on. Like sometimes, you know, I wake up and I'm like, don't know how you do it. And sometimes I get mad. He's always so positive. And I said, hey, buddy, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I said, those messages are not for you or anybody else. They're for me. Yeah. I said, because, and just so you know, and I'm only going to tell you this, and now I'm telling 3,600 subscribers that when I release those things, it's because I need a boost. Yeah. It's my mechanism for boosting myself. And in turn, hopefully, you know, you, you, you boost others, or as I always say, you raise yourself by raising others. So if I can raise somebody that day, I'm going to raise myself. Yeah. And so now when he sees something like that, I'll get a text or a call. Dude, you doing okay? Just checking in. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing good. Okay. <laughs> like, cause, you know, he knows, right? You know, because, you know, life brings us its stuff. You know, yeah. it gets delivered onto your doorstep and it's what you do with it yeah. and how you handle it that, that drives the outcome and how you feel about it. And, you know, I, I'm not superhuman. Sometimes I will feel crappy about something, but my spring has got a lot of recoil. Joe Walsh you know? been here a while back. I mean, it's about two years ago when they did their Eagles documentary and I'm sure people have seen that. I love that documentary. Um, he said, and they had a talking about his call to loud. You know, he's, he's had these big ups to now. And he said, he said, I, I heard saying, he said one time, hey, life is full of these ups and downs and, and some bad times and good times and, and beautiful times and, and horrific times. But when you looked at it at the end of your life, it's just beautifully crafted and all. And really, that's, that's all we're doing. If you can, get through the bad times and, and really extinguish those good times and, and build memories with your kids and your family. And it will get you to those little times. You're going to experience, that's just life. You're going yeah. to experience some very lows and some very bad times and some very heartbreaking times. Everybody does. And here's a quote, a good friend of mine. I don't know if it's a quote. It's a quote by them. Yeah. Yeah, I've passed out, flown all in this thing numerous times over the last six or seven years. And they had something really bad. And this is why I like this person because they're so positive. They had something really bad happen to them. And they said, but you know what, all? Someone's always got it worse. Yeah. You know, my mother used to say that. And they, it's just, just a single quotation, but if you really think about it, I mean, you've got something bad going on, and I've, I've got some friends that'll call me and say, man, this is why I got going on, I've been diagnosed with cancer, and I don't know that. Yeah. What's the problem? No, what's supposed to look like. I don't think you can get through it. I said, you know what? You can get through it. And this is, you know, what lock deal, deals to us. Just remember, somebody out there has always got it worse. And Amazing. What did I tell them that to? So they, they immediately get to feeling so much better than you. You know, you're right. I don't want to make it through this. And this, it goes back to being positive. I'm just like, you know, I get up early in the morning, I get up at 4, 4 30, and I just want to have a cup of coffee and get the day home. Yeah, get the day moving. It's, it's interesting. You, you read quotes and stuff, or, uh, and I do that too. Uh, another one I saw the other day is Billy Joel, and this was years ago. And he said, they asked him about how is he so good at what he does. He goes, you know, a world will be confident, such as having to be confident, and something that <laughs> they don't do that. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I had a friend who went to one of his lectures, <laughs> and he, there was a Q&A, and somebody, um, 
somebody, you know, you all get to ask a question. It was a music thing. And so everybody's, all these musicians are asking them all these questions. And one dude gets up and says, hey, uh, what's it like being married to Christy Brinkley? Um, no, I yeah, think. and at the time he was married to her, and he goes, "Well, it doesn't suck." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they turned it uptown girl. He wrote that yeah. song first. So. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Paul, suck. what an amazing, amazing night! I can't believe I looked down at our clock here, and an hour and twenty minutes oh, is gone yeah. past. Yeah. Oh, it feels like the night we the the second night we met, or the night we met when we had drinks till two in the morning. So. Oh, uh, uh, I, yeah. I I was going to ask you as a last question to drop pearl wisdom on everybody, but you did it, man. Somebody's always got it worse, and you know that that rings home with the advice my mother used to give me when mm. she'd talk about her life. And there's some pretty horrific shit that goes on, but there's even more horrific stuff that goes on. And yeah. for the most of us, like. You know, the problems are, they're manageable with a, with some grit, some determination and heart. And if you can steer clear of, you know, disease and things like that, you're winning. This is our self of family and friends. You, you got it. Comfort. You got it. Yeah. All right, my brother. Thank you so much. I super right. enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. You have an amazing evening. Talk to it you soon. Very awesome. Talk to you soon. Looking forward to it. Bye, guys. Right.